Uh, for those who may not know who I am, my name is Joseph Kibet, and I have the privilege to bring us God's word this morning. We have been going through a sermon series titled, Are You Convinced? And in this sermon series, we are trying to answer these three questions. What makes the heroes of the faith do the things that they did for God? We, when we look into the Bible, especially Hebrews 11, when, when we have the list of the, of the heroes of the faith, and when we look into the Old Testament and see these heroes of the faith, what made them behave uh, the way they did? What made them trust God that much? What made them uh, do all these things in service to God at such a huge cost to themselves? What makes people do anything for God? And the last question is, what makes people love God with all of their hearts, with all of their mind, with all of their soul, with all of their strength? What makes people get to that place? And so, there are several things that these heroes of the faith were convinced of, and that is making our sermon series this month. In the first sermon, we asked the question, are you convinced that Yahweh is God? These men and women who stood and represented God and did exploits for God did so because they were convinced that Yahweh is God. That if you, you would remove their relationship with God, if you would remove the fact that Yahweh was their God, then they would have accomplished nothing whatsoever. If you read the, the Gospel of John chapter 15, uh, should be about verses 4, 5, 6, that it says, Jesus speaks and says, without me you can do nothing. That we are only able to achieve exploits because of our relationship with God and because we are convinced that indeed Yahweh is God. Daniel chapter 11 verses 32 says, Daniel 11, 32, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt uh, with flattery. But the people who know their God, they shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Guys, if we do not know Yahweh to be God, if you're not convinced beyond a shadow of, of doubt that he is God, if we do not know him, then we will not experience the blessing that comes with this scripture. That those who know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. Amen? In that sermon, we looked at the story uh, of uh, Isaac and Rebekah, and that is in Genesis 26, verses 1 to 11. And Isaac, uh, together with his wife, colluded to lie that the wife is the sister. But the king observed and, and noticed that how Isaac is treating Rebekah is not how a brother treats a sister. And he, concludes that, he concluded that this actually is his wife. And we say that it is easy to call Yahweh our God, but the reality of our life does not testify the same thing. The Englishman says that your actions speak louder than your words. I believe this is still the same case for us. We said if you are convinced that Yahweh indeed is God over your life, then you'll have reverence for him. That then you will honor him. You will worship him. You will serve him. You will do everything for his glory. You will love him. And we said loving him is demonstrated by our obedience to him. It's not just declaring how much we love him, but how much we obey him. We also say that we will make him our first priority in life. He will be the first priority in our lives. And that if these things are not the reality of our lives, then even though we declare that Yahweh is our God, truly he is not our God. Something else is our God. The things that are filling these spaces, the thing that we, have, we are having reverence for and we honor and we worship and serve and, and glorify and obey and, and, and have as our first priority, then that thing is our God. We say that these things will be the reality of our lives because the love of Christ compels us. It's not because they are to, it's a to-do list, that we, uh, things that we have to check, no. It's because we acknowledge how much Christ loves us. And that love compels us to do these things to God. And we read 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15, which says, For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That if we are convinced that Yahweh is our God, that then we will no longer live for ourselves, we will live for him who laid down his life for us. That was the first sermon. The second sermon, which was last week, uh, was titled, Are you convinced that God is trustworthy? 
Are you convinced that God is trustworthy? And we said for anyone uh, to be trusted, they have to fulfill three main things. That first of all, they have to have honorable intentions, or rather their intentions need to be honorable. And we identify that God has honorable intentions towards us. Anything he tells us, anything he does towards us, it's from a place of love. He has good intentions towards us. He is not a God who is looking to harm us or to make things difficult for us. Anything and everything he brings our way is out of love. He has honorable intentions towards us. The next thing was that we need to identify that this person who we need to trust is reliable. And we identify that Yahweh is reliable. Anything he says he will do, he has the ability to do it. He is all-powerful. There is nothing too hard for our God. There is nothing impossible to our God. Yahweh is reliable. Therefore, we can trust him. The third and final thing we identified was that for us to be able to trust anyone, then whatever it is that they say must be truthful. They, they must not be liars. And we identify that indeed God is not a liar. He doesn't change his mind. Neither is he, let, let me just read that scripture. If I, if, I, if I can find it, oh Lord, I, I don't think I have it, but paraphrase it. God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he son of man that he should change his mind. And we read this scripture last week. God does not lie. We can trust anything that he says. And we had several take-homes from that sermon, and we said, if we truly trust God, then several things will be the reality of our lives. Again, it is very easy to say, I trust God, but the reality of our lives to be, I don't actually trust you, God. I, I trust you. In, eh? I will just say the words because I know it's a good thing for me to say, I trust you. But our actions will really prove if we truly trust him or not. We say that if we truly trust him, then we will believe whatever he says. We, we, we will not, we will not, we will not uh, rather raise questions and wonder, Lord, you said this and, and we are, how will you do it? You know those questions that you raise when you don't believe somebody? That we will trust him, we will take him at his word. That it will be as though he has given us cash. And even though cash is not gold, cash is just a representation of gold. That when God tells us something, it's like having that paper that proves that you have gold in the bank. That we can take his word literally to the bank. The second thing was that we will not doubt him. That if we truly trust him, whatever he says, we will not doubt. I will read a scripture to help us remember and to help explain further how we can avoid doubting God. Romans 4, 19. God had promised Abraham that he would be a father. And this is what Romans 4, 19 says. And not being weak in faith, Abraham did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. The reason why we end up doubting is because we are considering other things. Yes, God has said this, but my circumstances say this, but my situation says this, but people around me are saying this. And Abraham, Abraham's example here tells us very clearly, Abraham did not consider even his own body, the fact that his own body was dead. He was a hundred years old. He did not consider the fact that his wife's womb was dead because she, uh, she was barren all the days of her life. Abraham only considered what God said. And that is the only way we can live a life without doubting what God has said. Once we start considering what the doctor has said, doubt sets in. Once we start considering what the economy says, doubt sets in. Once we start considering how old or how young or whatever situation, doubt sets in. But if we would be like Abraham and say, God said it, I'm not considering any other voice, then that, then that is one of the ways that we will remove doubt from our lives. The third thing was that we will hold on to God regardless of the season we are in. But if I trust him, I trust his intentions, regardless the season he allows me to get into, I can still hold on to him. I will still, I will still trust him even though the season isn't a pleasing or a beautiful or a celebratory season. We say that we will not consider our physical senses, that the five senses we have will give us so much information, but we will not regard our physical senses. We'll just regard what God has said. 
We say that we will not regard what we feel or what, uh, what we feel in our hearts or our emotions. We will regard only what God says. That my heart may be leading me to do something else, but I will hold on to what God says. I will disregard my emotions. I will disregard the leading of my heart. And we explained from scripture last week that deceitful above all else is the heart of man. And that's why we cannot be led by our hearts or by our emotions, only led by our Lord Jesus Christ. We said that we will disregard, or rather, we will not be led by our logic and by our critical thinking. I'm not saying, I'm not saying we stop thinking. I'm not saying we stop uh, considering emotional health. I'm not saying we, we, we remove all these things from our lives. We, I'm just saying that these things are not leading us. I am not leading my life based on logic. I'm leading my life based on what God has said. Now, I continue obeying God and use the wisdom he has given me to implement these things. I use the logic he has given me to implement these things. But logic doesn't come first before what God has said. My emotions doesn't come first before what God has said and, and everything else that we have said. And we say that if we live a life of trusting God with all of our hearts, then there's a blessing that is attached to it. And we read it in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. This is what that scripture says. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence, that they are like a tree planted along a river bank, which with, with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. But if this is the posture of our heart, that then this is the blessing that we will receive as we trust God. Heroes of the faith were able to do the things that they did for God because they were convinced Yahweh is God. They were also convinced that God is trustworthy. When God gives you an instruction to go around a city and, and to, to shout, and you're thinking, that does not make logical sense. That, that is not a, a military strategy. J uh, J uh, the guy, Joshua and Israel, and Israel as a whole, would never have done that. They, were, they would have never conquered Jericho. They would have never uh, crossed the Red Sea. They would have never crossed the River Jordan. They, were, they, they would have never walked into the Promised Land if they, they did not completely trust God with all of their heart. And so today, we move on to the third sermon. And today, we are titling the sermon, Are You Convinced That You Will Give an Answer to God? The heroes of the faith were totally convinced that they, 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 they will be held accountable by God, that they will give a, an answer to God on how they live their lives and how they lead their people and how they carry themselves out. I will quickly quote uh, Samuel. Samuel said, may it not be seen for me that I failed to pray for you. Joshua, uh, let me, sorry, let me go to Joseph. Joseph said, how can I dare do this thing and sin against my God? These gentlemen, these women were convinced that God watches their every step and everything that they do and that they will give an account to God. If they were not convinced they will account to God, they would not have lived their lives the way they were living. They didn't just think that life is about here and now and when we die it is all gone. They knew that there's a life after death, that we will all stand before God. Scripture tells us that it is destined for man to die once and then after to face judgment. That all of us will give an account. But if we forget about that bit, then we will live our lives the way we want. Because anyway, there are no consequences. Anyway, it's all about here and now. YOLO, you only live once. So just, just live it the way you want. We are going to base this sermon today on the story of a gentleman called Akan. And this is found in the book of Joshua chapter 7. We are going to read the whole chapter. So please open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7. Oh, there we are. Joshua chapter 7 verses 1. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned, burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, 
which is near Beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not, um, do not worry the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were uh, routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites uh, from the city gate as far as the stone uh, quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Remaining there till evening, the elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the, Amalek uh, of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say? Not that Israel has been, now that Israel has been routed by its enemies, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to, to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things uh, they have stolen, they have lied, they have put them um, with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their, back, their backs and run because they have been made liable, and, uh, liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among us to Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. In the morning, present your, yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe of the Lord, that the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whomever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Early the next morning, uh, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribe and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of Zerahite come forward by family and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of uh, Carmi, son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I was in the, uh, when I saw the plunder, um, a beautiful drop from Babylon, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground as aside my tent with a silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with a silver underneath. They took the, uh, the things from the tent um, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zimri, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Acho. Joshua said, Why have you brought this trouble to us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burnt them. Um, over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remain to this day. Then the Lord turned from uh, his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Acho ever since. Blessed be the word of the Lord.
Today's message is not really encouraging us or cheering us on. It's calling us to account. And it is very easy for us, especially in our generation, to quickly explain God's wrath and God's justice away. To think that, you know, because God is such a loving God, he will not bring these things to us. Anyway, we have seen wicked men amass wealth and do so many things in wickedness, and God has done nothing whatsoever concerning their situation. I have come with a different report this morning, that God is still watching, and God will bring everyone to account. The timing is what we do not know. Here are several things that we can learn about how much God is serious about bringing justice to every evil thing, including sin that has been done. He was not testing the waters when he gave us the different instructions that he gave us. He wasn't, you know the way you, you're trying to pass a new constitution and you go to the ground and you're talking to people, eh? what do you guys think about this law and you're having public participation and everyone has their voice into that? God isn't, it is, God, God isn't participating in public participation when he gave us his laws and his instructions. The, he wasn't testing the ground. He wasn't testing the orders to see eh, how will human beings in 2024 respond to this law that I have given. Now, quick uh, sidebar. I am not saying we are under the law. We are made righteous by faith in Christ Jesus. That remains... But then the fact that we have been made righteous by faith in Christ Jesus does not give us the leeway to break God's law. It does not, doesn't allow us now to live in promiscuity and to, to live in sin and to do all these things that displease God. No. The Bible says, be ye righteous like your Father in heaven is righteous. The Bible tells us that without holiness, none of us will see God. That even though we have received righteousness by faith, we have to continuously live a righteous life. There is no tech two in life. I don't know if you have ever played uh, these video games and, and, and you know you have like three or four lives. If, 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 you, if you die once, yeah, you just come back alive and then you keep on playing until you have lost all your four or three lives. If you have never played them, that's how it looks like. But this, the life that we have here on earth, we only have tech one. We don't have a tech two recording of our life. You know the way you mess an interview and, and, and you can do tech two or something of that sort. We don't have tech two in life. We only have one tech. We only have one chance to do it right. There are consequences of, of, on how we live our lives. And they could be immediate consequence for some of us, but surely there is eternal consequence for how we live our lives here on earth. Sin is, sin is not bad because uh, because God said it's bad. God said it's bad because sin is bad. I don't, let me, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, you know the way you, you could tell your child, don't play with the fire? You are saying don't play with the fire does not make the fire bad. You say don't play with the fire because the fire will harm the child. Make sense? So God telling us not to do these things, it's, he didn't make it bad by saying don't do these things. He pointed, he's pointing out to us, if you do several things, these things are bad to you, so don't do them. He didn't make them bad by saying don't do them. I don't know if it's clear. Makes sense? Good, thank you. So sin is bad and has consequences. This should be a memory verse for us. Romans 6, 28. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He isn't mincing his words. The wages of sin is death. Hell is real. I don't know the last time uh, when you heard a sermon about hell. Today is not a sermon about hell, but I'm just mentioning it. Hell is real. Mark 7, 48, 47, uh, sorry, Mark 9, 47 and 48. Mark 9, 47 and 48. Let's, pre let's please read it together. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. And this is Jesus speaking. And we remember what we learned about last week. Anything God says, we can take it to the bank. So, 
we not only trust God in the promises he has given us, we also take his word around caution on, on things to the bank. We trust what he says. So when he says hell is real, and the worms in hell do not die, and the fire is not put off, because he is the one who said it and he is trustworthy, we can take his word to the bank. And believe you me, hell is real. God is judge. He is a judge. He is our judge. Psalms 96, 13. Psalms, let's please read it together. Is, is it? Psalms 96, 13. Okay, mine looks a bit different. Let, okay, uh, I'll read mine and then possibly we will see if it looks alike. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Is it the same? Ish. Okay, maybe it was copied halfway, sorry. But he is judge and he comes to judge all of us. i just like you to think of it this way. When your life here on earth is over, even if you live for 200 years, at some point it will end, yeah? So at that point when it ends, and you stand before God, the judge of all the universe, what do you think he will tell you? Will he say, good and faithful servant, welcome into your rest? Or will he say, depart from me, you wicked servant? Be thrown out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. What do you think the righteous judge will tell you? Because we will all stand before him. People will be sent to hell. In, in a church somewhere, um, I don't mention which one, there was someone around, something like this, and then we, we, uh, we had a, a Q&A and people were asking questions and, and, and answering. So the preacher asked the congregation a question. Um, do you think God will send you to heaven or to hell? Then somebody stood up and said, nobody will go to hell. God is such a loving God, he will send no one to hell. I was shocked to hear that, that believers in our current generation are actually convinced that nobody, God, a loving God will not send anyone to hell. Now, God is so loving, but he is equally just. He will lovingly send all the sinners to hell. Oh, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. Maybe it doesn't sound so good. You know the way you will punish your child and correct them because of how much you love them? Huh? God is judge to all of us, and he will send every person who has not received Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. He will send them to hell. But his heart will be broken in the process. He will do it heartbroken because he loves you. But he will still send you to hell. Whatever a man sows, man being gender neutral, so shall they reap. Don't take his patience to mean that he won't judge. And I think that is the biggest challenge with our generation. Because we see he doesn't execute immediate justice to people. Then we kind of conclude that he is no longer executing justice like in the time of Achan. Time of Achan, it was immediate. It was thorough. It was right there and then. But then in our generation, he isn't, he's, he's very patient with us. And he's giving us an extra day and an extra week and an extra month, an extra year, an extra decade. And you're like, I have lived this way for the past five decades. If God was to punish me, he would have punished me by now. So let's read scripture together. Second Peter 9, 8, and 10. Second Peter 9, 8 to 10. If you are there in your Bibles, please say amen. Second Peter is towards the end of the Bible. So just go to Revelation and then go backwards. Several books you'll find. Second Peter. Second Peter 9, 8 to 10. If you're there, please say amen. Amen. Two people are there. You know, it's wrong, wrong reference. Muna niangalia fani. What's up? It's, there's no nine? Is it first Peter then? That's why I'd like us reading together so that we can, we can, we can, we can point us out some of these things. Okay. Uh, is it... Is, there isn't... Okay, we wrote a, a wrong scripture reference. Okay, I will read it and somebody help me find it. Beloved... 
Do not let this one thing escape your notice. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And it's, which one? It's 3, 8, oh, 2 Peter 3, not 9. Thank you, thank you, Ryle. So let's please all turn to 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10. I'd like us to read it together. 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10. Thank you. Let's please read it together. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to, uh, to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ten. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in, uh, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. And Peter is just trying to explain to us the fact that he is not executing justice immediately. It's not because he won't. He, he does not go back on his word. He's just being patient. Let me read my version. Uh, that other version is a bit harder. Behold, do not let this one thing escape your mind. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow to keep his promise, as some understand slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and its works will be laid bare. And he's giving us the reason why he's taking his time to bring judgment and justice. He's saying, I'm giving you more time so that you may come into repentance. As we wind down our, our, our sermon this morning, if we are convinced that we will give an account to the Lord, then our lives will look in a specific way, it will look different. So there are several things that we will do rather. The first one is, we will receive Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. If we know and we are certain that we will face judgment, that we will stand before God and we will account to him, we will receive him as Lord and Savior. Now, I'm going to explain it a little bit and then we'll move on to the others. We read Romans 6.23 which says, the wages of sin is death. And there is none, I've finished, I've just quoted the first bit, there's none among us who is perfect. There's none among us who in of themselves are pure. And so because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, that all of us should face that judgment. However, God loves us so much and he said, because I love you so much, I would not want anyone to perish I don't, want, I don't want anyone to go to hell. I don't want anyone to pay for their sin. So I am sending my one and only son to die on the cross for your sin. So that if you only believe in him, that he was raised from the dead, and that you, in, you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, that then you'll be saved. Romans 10, 9. He asks us of two things only, that you believe in him. He came as a human being, lived on earth, died on the cross for your sin, was raised from the dead on the third day. It's as simple as believing that. And then inviting him to rule your life, inviting him to be Lord over your life. Before we continue with this sermon, I'd like to give anyone here who has never made that decision to receive Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. If you are convinced that you will stand before God on that day and give an account for your life, if you would not have received Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you are assured of hell. That's what Christ tells us in the word. But if you have received Jesus, Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, then you are assured of eternal life with him. So if you'd like to make that prayer and to receive Christ, like you, I'd just like all of us to bow down. And if you'd like to make that prayer to receive Christ, just repeat this prayer after me, meaning it from deep within your heart. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I receive you today to be my Savior. I also invite you to be the Lord of my life, to have the final say as concerns my life. 
I receive you to be Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and lead me in ways of righteousness so that when you come back for your church, I'll be counted among us the number. From today, I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've made that prayer for the very first time, welcome to, to the family of Christ. The Bible tells us that all those who believed in him and received him, he gave them the power to become the children of God. So welcome to the body of Christ, to the family of Christ. If you're here, please let me know that you made that prayer for the very first time or any one of our pastors or ministry leaders. But if you're online, please reach out to us through our um, social media platforms. We'd like to walk alongside you to help you understand what that means. Because it's not just about making that prayer, it's about a transformation of your life. Once you make that prayer, then you will submit to him as Lord. We mentioned Lord, that you allow him to lead your life. And so that's the first thing you will do if you trust and if you are convinced that you will give an account to the Lord, that you will do that first step. But number two, that you will live a life submitted to Christ. If you are convinced you'll stand before the king of all kings, like Achan had to stand before God, then you will live a life submitted to Christ. But then you will live in obedience to God. When one man sins against God, casing point Cain, they will be judged as one man. When one family, casing point, Adam and Eve sin against God, they as a family will face the punishment of God. If a nation sins against God, casing point, Israel, as they were sent into exile, they will all answer for, their, for how they live their lives. If the entire world sins against God, except one or two people, casing point, the time of Noah, God will judge the entire world. There's a lie that goes around. Since everyone is doing it, God will not punish the entire world. He has done it before. Even if one person remains to be faithful, only that one will escape God's judgment. So if we are convinced we will stand before God, then we will live in obedience to God. We will not excuse sin like we in this generation excuse sin. We will not assume that God... Since God is not bringing punishment immediately, then that he will not bring punishment at all. If we know we will stand before God to answer, then we will hate sin. Then we will not explain sin away. Then we will not condone sin in our lives and say, Mimi ukuanga ivi, this is how I am. We will not take it. There are some sins that we easily explain away and we say, no, this, 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 is, this, is, this is easy, Mbaya. We explain pride away. It is sinful before God. We explain the bribes away on our roads. And for us, it is more important for us to save a day and some cash being in court than to be pleasing to our master in heaven. Some of us explain unforgiveness away if you knew what they did to me, you would also not forgive them. That's what people say. But unfor unforgiveness is seen before God. And because society understands and because everyone understands, I would, not have, I would not have forgiven them. It is seen before God. Let's not explain sin away. We explain premarital sex. Everyone is doing it. Or extramarital affairs. Everyone is doing it. And we're thinking because everyone is doing it and it's okay. Guys, it's wrong. It's sin before God. And it breaks his heart. We explain lies away. Niko kwa kona. I'm five minutes away and you know how to kwa nyumba. It is sin before God. We explain it away, guys. If we are convinced that we will stand before God and answer him, we will not explain any sin away. We will hate sin. We will not excuse sin. We will not condone sin. The third thing, we will live for God's glory. If we are convinced we will stand before God one day and we will be judged for how we lived our life here on earth, we will live for God's glory. Let me explain. God's judgment is not only in the negative. 
it's also in the positive that whatever man sows so shall they reap if you if you sow into the spirit if you if you i'm, I'm not talking about finances and planting seeds i'm talking about the things you do for god's glory including encouraging somebody else, including praying for somebody else, including serving, these things that God has asked us to do, if you respond in obedience to God, there's a blessing, there's a reward that comes with living in obedience to God. His justice to us is not just punishing evil and sin, it is rewarding everything you did for his glory. And so if you are convinced you'll stand before God on that day, or oh, then you will live your life knowing, is I will receive a reward for everything I'm doing. Even if Pastor Kibet does not recognize what you are doing, even if no one else celebrates the sacrifice you are doing here or anywhere else, even if no one else sees. In fact, he says, when you pray, go into your closet, close the door and pray because your father who sits in secret will reward you. He will reward everything you do for him. That is part of what he will do. And we get to see the parable of the talents. You know how that went, Matthew 25, 14 to 30. We're not reading it for, for time's sake. But we will give an account for everything God has given us. For the education he has given you, you will give an account. For the connections you have, for the resources you have, for the career you have, for the children you have, you will give an account to God. So are we ready to give an account to God based on how we raise our children? Can we genuinely stand before God on that day and say, Lord, I raised these children up in your ways, and I, Lord, I prayed for them, and I did all these things. I taught them the word of God. Or did I explain that just children they don't understand, that they never taught them the word of God? Guys, we will stand before God and answer. The fourth and final thing, if we are convinced we will stand before God and answer, then we will serve him. Galatians 6, 7, and 9, our second last verse as we end. Please let, let's read it together so that we ascertain it's in Scripture. Galatians 6, 7, and 9. Let's read it together. Don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death but those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit so don't get tired of doing what is good don't get discouraged and give up for we will reap a harvest of blessing at the appointed time guys this is not me telling us this is god telling us in his word the reason why we continuously beg of us would you please serve would you please do these things for God? It's not for my sake. I don't benefit in any way. It is for your account. I'd want that when I get, I'm doing this thing for me. When I get into heaven, I'll receive my reward. I don't want that when we get into heaven, I have my reward, but you don't have any reward or you barely have any reward because you didn't live for God's glory, didn't get to serve him. I'd like us to end our service by making a prayer. I will read this scripture. Okay, let's read it all together. First John 3, 4 and 10 to 10. And then we will pray based on this scripture. First John chapter 3, verses 4, all the way to 10. Let's please read it together. Those who sin are opposed to the law of God. For all sin opposes the law of God. Uh -huh. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sin, for there is no sin in him. So if we continue to live in him, we won't sin either. But those who keep on sinning have never known him or understood who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it is because they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows they don't uh, it shows they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning but the son of god came to destroy these works of the devil those who have been born of god's family into god's family do not sin because god's life is in them so they can't keep on sinning because they have been born of god 
So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not obey God's commands and does not love other Christians does not belong to God. I don't like to add anything to it. I'd like you to respond in prayer. In your own words, what you are hearing from this sermon, it could be you are praying for strength to keep on living in obedience to God. It could be that you are repenting for excusing sin and excusing lies. The Bible says, if you break even the smallest of the law, you have broken it, it, it in its entirety. If it's repentance, please repent. If it's asking for more grace to serve God and to live for his glory, please do. And then we'll end our service.